Hi everyone. So as I mentioned in the last video, um, we are going to be talking about the Gerskorin circle theorem. So this is a so if you recall, we had the Ruth Hurwitz criteria, which gave necessary and sufficient conditions for the uh, roots of a polynomial being uh, having negative real part. But those are somewhat hard to work with. We also gave uh, some necessary conditions in that all the co uh, all the coefficients have to be positive if you want negative coefficients, but those weren't sufficient. So in today's uh, well, in this video, we're going to be giving uh, some easier sufficient conditions. They're not necessary, but they are sufficient for showing that the roots all have negative uh, all have negative real parts. And to do this, we're going to make use of something called the Gerskorin uh, circle theorem, which is more general than the sort of things where we care about. But it's a general result which you may or may not recall from your linear algebra class. I'm not actually sure if all the different linear algebra classes here at UTSE uh, teach it, but I know that some of them do. So uh, this is going to be theorem 4.5 in Linda's Allen's textbook, but you can also find it in basically any uh, standard um, theoretical linear algebra text. So like uh, your scorn. And the statement of the theorem is if we have a matrix, uh, which uh, I'm going to give it uh, in broader generality. So this is going to be a complex matrix. Um, so all the, coefficient, all the entries of the matrix are complex. And then we're going to let di, we're going to define a disk, uh, be, we're going to let di be equal to the disk for all z, uh, such that z minus i, a sub i i is less than or equal to r i uh, for z in the complex numbers. So you notice that this is basically a uh, circle, so a disk around the point uh, a i i uh, of radius r i. Uh, and we're going to define the radius ri uh, as equal to the sum over i equal, oh, sorry, let me use j, uh, j equal 1 to n, uh, sum from j equal 1 to n of, uh, just a moment, uh, and j, j can't be equal to i, so we're going to ignore i for that, of the magnitude of a i j okay so it's going to be uh so we'll see this in a little bit more detail but basically if you take uh all the a i j's so this is all the things in row i except for the diagonal element you sum together their absolute values and that gives you this radius r i and uh, basically what we're saying is that uh there's a disk around the element a i i so that diagonal element where you take the sum of the moduluses of all the other elements well, the distance from that, um, this disk is precisely the disk that flat radius from that a diagonal element. Okay, then all eigenvalues, lambda i of a, lie in the union of these Gerskorin disks, lie in the union over i equal 1 to n of di. Um, and we'll give a couple examples of this uh, later on, just to make it a little bit more clear. So, but in particular, uh, if lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then for some i, we know that lambda minus A i i is less than or equal to R i. Okay? And so this is the Gerskorin circle theorem. The proof of it is fairly elementary, though uh, there is a couple um, slightly unintuitive steps. So we'll let lambda v be, be an eigenpair, pair of A, uh, where v is going to be e, uh, a column vector, v1 through vn. Uh, so obviously that means that a v is equal to lambda v. So if you rewrite this out in index notation, you have for each entry vi, lambda vi is equal to the sum over j equal 1 to n of aij vj. But of course, you can, uh, you can separate this out and you can move the uh, entry that corresponds to j equal to i over to the left hand side. And so you end up with lambda minus aii times vi is equal to the sum over j equal 1 to n 
but j is not equal to i of aij bj. Okay, and now what we do is we let bk uh, be the element with the greatest magnitude, be the element with greatest magnitude, so the biggest thing uh, in B. Uh, so that is to say, uh, more precisely, we have the modulus of Vk is greater than or equal to Vj uh, for all j in 1 through n. So it's one of the biggest things, at least. Well, then we have that Vj divided by Vk. Well, obviously, that modulus has to be less than or equal to 1. So this is almost by definition. Which then implies that if you divide both sides, uh, if you take moduluses of everything, take absolute values of everything, and divide both sides by um, uh, v the vi, you get lambda. Uh, so we're going to let i equal to k here. So lambda minus a k k is less than or equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n, and we're going to say j is not equal to k, of the math, a modulus of a k j times the vj over vk. Well, of course, that's less than or equal to 1. So this entire thing is less than or equal to j equal 1 to n, j not equal to k of a k j. So therefore, lambda is in the disk uh, k, the k character uh, score in disk. And this proves the theorem. Um, and one of the nice, easy corollaries, so this is corollary 4.3 is that if you let A be a real matrix, uh, then if AII is less than minus RI, uh, where, of course, our RI is defined in the same way as the radius, uh, so this is J equal 1 to N, J not equal to I, of the absolute values of the AI Aijs, and these are just normal absolute values because these are all real numbers now. For i equal one, two through n, then the eigenvalues of a a have negative real parts. Okay, so let's go ahead and give an example. So, let's say that we had A is equal to the matrix A minus 1, 3, 1 half B and minus 2, and 0 minus 5 C. Well, then we have that R1 is equal to 4, R2 is equal to 5 halves, and this is because this is um, the absolute value of minus 1 plus the absolute value of 3, and this is of course the absolute value of 1 half plus the absolute value of minus 2. Oh, sorry. And we have R3 is equal to 5, um, since this is the absolute value of minus 5. And so let's look at this a little bit pictorially. So we have uh, the complex plane. So these are the disks. So what are the different radii? So uh, we have our point A somewhere. So let's say we, uh, and it's a real number, so let's say we have some point A here. Uh, let's call this A, and then we have a disk of radius 4 around it. So, disk of radius 4. And let's say we have some uh, B, uh, say we have some B here, and let's see, 5 halves. Uh, make that a 4. And this is our B here, and this is 5 halves. And then maybe we have our, uh, say we have our C here, and then you have some radius 5. Let's see if I can draw this. Uh, I apologize for the bad drawings. But so you have these overlapping disks, and what you can say is that all the radii are in at least one of these disks. So if you were to draw them out like this, well, then in this particular case, uh, you might have some that were positive, because you might have a eigenvalue over here. 
Oh, uh, uh, or over here, or something like that. Ah, what just happened? You might have an eigenvalue there. On the other hand, if you were to have the case where they were all negatives, so suppose your A was over here, you had your disk, your, your B is here, you have your disk, and let's say your C is also here, and you have some disk. Well, in that case, you know that all the eigenvalues lie in those disks, and therefore they all have negative real parts. Uh, let's see, this is the real axis, and this is the imaginary axis. And so what the Gershkorn circle theorem says is that, so if uh, A is less than minus 4, because it has to be less than minus 4 in order for uh, the disk to not uh, intersect with the positive half plane, um, and B is less than minus 5 over 2, and C is less than minus 5, then all eigenvalues have negative real part. Uh, though you should note that this is not a um, the, this is a sufficient condition, but it is not a um, required condition, not a necessary condition. So if I'm going to give the example 4.16 here, which is that a is equal to minus 2, 1, 0, 1, minus 2, 1, and 0, 1, minus 2. Well, then r1 is equal to r3, which is equal to 1, uh, and r2 is equal to 2. Uh, but uh, a22 is equal to r2, and so it's not less than that. And so corollary 4.3 does not say that eigenvalues have negative real part. But you note that lambda 1, 2, and 3, the three eigenvalues, are minus 2 and minus 2 plus or minus the square root of 2. So eigenvalues do have negative real part. Uh, so this is just saying corollary 4.3 is sufficient but not necessary. So what's happening here is you, ha you still have your uh, complex plane and, <coughs> and even if uh, so you can have the cases where uh, you can have cases where your disks do intersect the positive half plane, but maybe all your eigenvalues still happen to be negative. So this is not necessarily uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean that your eigenvalues don't have necess of there. Simply because the the corollary doesn't apply doesn't mean you don't have negative real parts. So it's only a sufficient condition. Okay, so hopefully that was a quick review of Gerskorn circle theorem, and sometimes it's useful because then you can use it to say that you have a ODE that actually does have some sort of stability criterion because all the eigenvalues are on the negative half plane. Um, and in the next video, we'll talk about actually doing a phase plane analysis of um, systems of two first order ODEs, which uh, will uh, so we'll getting be getting a lot more pictorial examples of the sort of stability of these uh, systems.